1977, it vividly, I think most people remember this, like when you're young and you see that spaceship going over your head, and it's like one of those visceral things that's burned into your brain, yeah. which you like you remember for the rest of your life. I was seven years old. I saw it at the Fort Way in, uh, in, um, in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. I, I remember it like it was yesterday, but you were 27 at this time or something. Yeah, and it, it was, the thing was, it was the most, in, in my opinion, it was the single most impactful film in the history of the motion picture industry. Why? Well, it not only changed filmmaking and the mm. approach to things, it also changed the publishing industry. Ah. All right. So it was this huge step function that nobody saw coming. Right. And it was George's vision to make it happen. And then George did something which was very unusual in Hollywood. He looked at his team and he had the best team in the world for photo optical processing. In order to get motion blur, which is a technical thing here, but in order for the effects to look right, you actually have to have blur in the direction of motion. Right, because if you don't, it looks too crisp, and that's not how our brains work. Is yeah, that right? Your, your eyes see it. And, what, and the reason is film was projected with every frame shown twice. So if you're tracking across the screen, then what happens is a sharp edge shows up and it's double. Mm. So what you see is a doubled image going across the screen. Ah. And so your, your brain's saying, okay, this isn't really there. <laughs> right. Whereas with regular live action, it's actually blurred in the, in the direction of motion. You can't see the edge now because it's blurred. Mm. So it's not, it, your eye isn't being drawn to it mm. and therefore it works. Right. Doing this <clears throat> with film is very difficult. Yeah. And he, he was doing models, like actual physical models and filming them. How much of it, was any of it computer animated? In this? Yes, what they did was they had a computer control to move the models. Got it. And they're photographing it again blue screen. Got it. So from George's point of view, they were using high technology to help advance the imagery to something that nobody had ever seen before. Right. Therefore, his view was, I want to keep investing in technology because it's brought something fresh. Mm. So he went out to look for somebody to run the lab. And he interviewed people all around the, the, the country. He had somebody looking for it. And he, he was looking for somebody to run this lab, which I guess eventually became what people know as ILM. Uh, no. No. ILM was in existence. Got it. I was hired to start up the computer division. The computer division. Which was never part of ILM. Interesting. So we were in the building next door. Huh. We were friendly with them. And to be honest, at that time, because computer graphics was lower resolution, they didn't think it was relevant to them either. Even though the big man on the top said it is relevant, there was two camps. Well, it, it wasn't so much a camp. It was like, they, they were, first of all, they're very friendly. So there was nothing standoffish about them. Right. It's just that what we're doing didn't match their standards. Just on the fidelity of it. It wasn't a... <laughs> on it, fidelity, it, yeah. It didn't look right yet. But uh, Lucas yeah, it, saw it. The, the resolution, the details. Well, it was more he was... It wasn't that he saw it. He believed in the principle. Mm of supporting the R&D, because he didn't know where it was going either. Ah. And, it, and it really was hiring us to support one thing they were doing, which was matting. But what we brought was the vision of making the computer graphics and the imagery, which was beyond what he had hired me for. Right. He wanted three things. He wanted digital compositing, he wanted digital audio, mm. and he wanted uh, video editing. Right, because at that time, people were splicing mm. film together. That's right. It, there was no Final Cut or any of that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, none of that stuff. So we did the research. We were pushing ahead for work, building around things that were going to come, even building hardware, convincing the people at ILM that we had something that was very good. And as I said, we did have a good rapport with them. And from their point of view, while they didn't see it originally, they also felt like, well, it's George's money. Do what he wants. So they weren't antagonistic. Right. And he had a lot of money at that time because the Star Wars had just, he had maintained the rights to the merchandising, yes. I mean, he had become fabulously wealthy and was outside the system and able to fund his own visions. I mean, That's it was right. truly unique in the world. And he wanted to be in the, in the Bay Area. Also unique for a filmmaker. That's right. He did not want to be too close to that system because it was too ingrown and closed and so forth. Up here, he could be free to do what he wanted to do. Hmm. And so that gave us the freedom to pursue each of these, and then ultimately later, uh, we added a games group to right. us. 
Hey, everybody. This episode is brought to you by my friends and in partnership with my friends at Audible. And Audible, as you know, is one of my favorite services in the world because I love books. But I have constant downtime when I'm walking and going on my hikes, uh, driving in airplanes, and even when I want to go to bed at night. You know, I'm one of these people, I get so enthusiastic sometimes. I'm on fire and I need to go to sleep. And I can't watch television because it keeps me up. What I do is I put my earplugs in. I put the sleep timer in my Audible app on 20 minutes. And I listen to some book, whatever it is. And, you know, the book uh, I was talking about recently, Creativity, Inc. by Ed Catmull. What an amazing book where you're going to learn so much about running a company and how to get people to be creative and how to get people to feel safe in their work environment and how to do really innovative things like Pixar did. And Ed's got an amazing story and it's really an inspiring book and educational. Um, if you haven't used Audible, you can use it anywhere. It's on iPhone, iPad, Android, Windows, everything. And it's unlike any uh, streaming service out there because you own the books. And it's whisper sync ready. So you can go right between your audio book and Kindle. You can read at home, listen to the car, as I've said. And if you don't like a book, they will take it back. No questions asked. I love going to the Audible site and just looking at the reviews. The people and the community at Audible are amazing because they love audiobooks too. They love the spoken word and the reviews are always on point. I always get great, great um, advice. So go to audible.com slash twist, go to audible.com slash twist and start a 30 day f uh, trial membership. You get a free audiobook and download my book of the week, which is Creativity Inc. by Ed Catmull. It is an amazing, amazing book. Here it is. I'm holding the book in my hand, but I want you to get the audio book. Go to audible.com slash twist and buy Creativity Inc. Or get it for free, actually. 30 day free membership. They give you a free book. It's an incredible service. I love it. Oh, and you know, by the way, it used to be you had to like download these audio books and then sync them. Now they have these apps. You can just click a button and you can download it on the go and we'll download the first couple chapters for you and you can read it. So it's so easy now. It's very easy to use uh, Audible and uh, it gets my highest, highest rating. I love Audible and you will love Audible too. You'll love getting smart. Go to audible.com slash twist. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. 